In the time remaining, turn with me to John chapter 12. Well, can you believe it? Two weeks from today is going to be Advent, the first Sunday of Advent. If you don't know what Advent is all about, I'll explain that to you as we get into the season of Advent. It, uh, one of the oldest traditions within the church goes all the way back to the 700s, which the contemporary churches seem to have forgotten, with, along with so many other things that the contemporary churches seem to have forgotten. And they're even trying to forget the Old Testament now. <laughs> I have to laugh or I'd cry. <laughs> but uh, let's see, a week, not this week, but the next week, next Thursday will be Thanksgiving. Yeah, don't you love Thanksgiving? Mm, love Thanksgiving. But we should show our Thanksgiving and our thanks living, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're looking here in John 12, and we're seeing a family that really, truly did love the Lord, and we're showing their thanks, giving in their thanks, living to him. In chapter 12, this will be the end of Jesus' public ministry to Israel. From then on, he will be, his ministry will be completely to his disciples, to those who love him. And it begins by saying then, chapter 12, verse 1, John's gospel. Everybody there? Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Why is that important, that it's six days before the Passover? Because this will be the last week of his life. He's entering into the week of his passion. Jesus said over and over and over prior to this, my hour has not come, my hour has not come, my hour has not come. He said to his mother Mary, what does that have to do with me? My time has not yet come. But now, now we begin. His hour has come. And he goes to Bethany. Jesus came to Bethany. What does Bethany mean? House of poverty. Those those who were spiritually impoverished previously, but now are rich in the Lord. That's what we were, right? Before we came to Christ, we were living in spiritual poverty, destitute of the things of God and the knowledge of God, the purposes of God, the power of God. Oh, but now, now we are rich in Christ. You see, there's no reason that the church isn't getting involved in doing the things that God would motivate them, equip them to do. All they have to do is surrender. Now, you can act like a worldly person, in pursuit of pleasures and possessions and everything that this world has to offer, which is dung, Paul would tell us. Even as a believer, you can pursue those things and not choose the things of the kingdom. Or, or you can yield to the Holy Spirit and, and pursue those things that God would have you pursue no matter what the cost. No longer house of poverty. No, now they are rich, rich in the Lord. He went to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Who's Lazarus? Have you been born again? Who's Lazarus? I was dead, and now I'm alive. Is that not true of every one of us? Were you not dead? Are you not excited about that? 80,000 people got excited over pigskin. (laughs) Can't you get excited over the fact that you were dead? And now you've been resurrected spiritually? In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And everyone that followed, right? Our original parents, our first parents, Adam and Eve, everyone who followed them were dead spiritually. Only Christ could revive you. You have to be born once in order to be born twice, right? So who's Lazarus? Who's Lazarus? All right, all right, you got it. (laughs) Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made us, uh, him a supper. Made who a supper? Jesus. Why? Because they're, they're so excited and grateful for what he has done. Now, we read previously, and we're going to read further on into the chapter, that the leadership, the Sadducees in particular, what was their desire? What were they plotting to do? Kill him. Kill him. And anybody that would be associated with him would be excommunicated excommunicated from the temple or they might be killed. As a matter of fact, we're going to read this Lazarus who'd been raised from the dead causes a real problem for the Sadducees. Why? They don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're so sad, you see, right? 
But they don't believe in the resurrection. But now right before their very eyes is a man who's been resurrected from the dead. And they'd rather embrace their faulty ideology and kill the evidence. They're going to plot to kill Lazarus. How do you kill somebody twice? How do you kill a man who's come back from the dead? He's going to laugh at you. He's going to bring it on. You don't know where I've been. You think I want to be here? <laughs> they made a supper for him, for Jesus, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Wow, now Martha's serving. They went to Bethany, but whose house are they in? Simon who? Simon the leper. You think he's still a leper? No. Why do you think Simon's opened up his house? He's been cleansed. He's been clean. A miracle has happened to him. Now, that's recorded for us both in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel. And now we're going to look at what Mary's response is to all of this in her anointing of Jesus, which is also recorded for us in Matthew and Mark's gospel. There is an anointing in Luke's gospel in chapter 7. It is not the same. It is a very different person, different anointing. That woman was a prostitute. Mary of Bethany, is she a prostitute? No. No, no, no. That, that anointing was in Galilee. In uh, Judea, this is in Galilee. Or excuse me, this is in Judea. That was in Galilee. So the anointing of Jesus in Luke 7 is very different from the anointing in Mark, Matthew, and in John's gospel. Different woman, but the three are the same. It's Mary. And we're told in the gospels that she was at Simon the leper's house. And what's Martha, Martha doing? What she always does. <laughs> Yeah, she, you know, some of you have that gift of servants. You know, you just love to serve. And you have the gift of hospitality. And so Martha is there now. How familiar Martha and Mary and Lazarus were with Simon the leper. I don't think they had any previous experience with Simon before that. But Simon was healed by the Lord and became a child of God. And so where does Jesus go? To his family. Listen, this is the true family of God. Simon. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and everyone else who adored and believed and loved Jesus. That's the family. More than a biological family who are not saved. You'll find Jesus always where his family is. Why? Because you'll find the family following Jesus. Hmm? And he loved Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. Mary, verse 3, then took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Now, this uh, spikenard, this perfume, would come from a root that would only be found in the northern part of India, up in the Himalayas. Very, very, very expensive. This uh, pound is, uh, a Roman pound is about 12 ounces in our measure. So this 12 ounces of spikenard, or this perfume, would be worth a whole year's wages. 300 denarii is going to tell us. If you worked for a day and you were a day laborer, you'd make a denarii a day. So 300 days wages, a year's wage. This was everything she had. This was her 401k. This is whatever financial security that might have been offered to her. And she's giving it all to who? To Jesus. Wow. And she took this oil of sparknard, sparknard, anointed the feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, every time we see Mary, what position is she in when she comes to the Lord? At his feet. At his feet. The first, the first time we see Mary, it's in Luke's gospel. And what is she doing at his feet? Being blessed by the word. Just take, taking in the words in the life of Jesus. That's what we need to do. The, the second time we see Mary, what was happening then? She's petitioning him with all of her burdens and her cares. When was that? Lazarus was dead. Lord, Lord, I, I do know if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. She wasn't being accusatory. She was just stating a fact. Lord, I know if you had been here, my, my brother would not have died. Lord, I'm so hurt. I am so grieved, Lord. Lord, I'm casting my burden of grief and pain and sorrow upon you. Oh, how he answered that prayer. Hmm? And, now, and now, so the next time we see Mary, she's at his feet again. But what is she doing this time? Worship. Worship. This family, Lazarus, Martha, Mary, they, they represent what should actually be going on in your life and in my life since we've met the Savior. What happened for Lazarus? Dead and now alive. Born again. 
And therefore, because we're born again, we do like Mary, we worship. And our worship is really demonstrated. Worship isn't singing songs before the worship team. What's the word in the Greek text? Proskonos. It means to turn towards and to... Right? To kiss. To show you. It's, a, it's an act of devotion and love and commitment and sacrifice that is done daily. As, as a husband should love his wife, sacrificially, unconditionally, so too the, the church should adore and love Jesus. But Jesus is the one who loves us unconditionally, sacrificially. But in response, right, as with Mary, Mary is going to offer everything she has in worshiping at his feet. And therefore, like Martha, we get up after worship, and what do we do? Serve. We serve. Listen, listen, this family represents what should be going on in every one of our lives because you've met the Savior. And if it isn't, you need to take it to the Lord. You need to take it in prayer. You need to ask yourself, what's wrong with me? Why am I not doing this? Why am I not so grateful that I was dead and now I'm alive? Why am I not worshiping the way I should with all of my life, all that I am? Why am I not serving? And how do I serve the Lord? By serving his body. Whoever that might be. You Listen. All you have to do is ask the question, Lord, who is it? Boom. He'll put it right in front of you. Believe me. Hmm? And now she takes this, this spike nard. All that she has and she offers it to him. Now, just, just the fact that they put this dinner together in honor of Jesus puts them at risk. Do you understand that? Their lives are at risk because they had this dinner party take place. What risk do we suffer? What risk are, are we under because we want to show our love and devotion to Jesus in this society right now? Yeah. Nothing. People may not like you. You get a cowbell in your ear for an hour. You know, I mean, that's what happened, right? I'm still hearing it. You know? <laughs> we don't, we don't, we don't, just, There's no risk. There's no risk in us allowing this world to know how much we love Jesus, how much we desire to serve Jesus, that we were dead and we're alive. They were risking everything. You understand? In a few moments, you're going to read, maybe today, I don't know. In a few, (laughs) one point you'll read that they are going to plot to kill not only Jesus now, but they're going to kill Lazarus again. (laughs) The madness, the insanity of unbelief, you know what? Mary, worshiping at his feet. And, and the text in Matthew and Mark tell us, not, she not only anointed his feet, what else did she anoint? His head. His head. When you wanted to really anoint someone and bless them, you would start by anointing their head. It was very refreshing. My cup runneth over. The psalmist said in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over the Lord, anointeth my head, right? And, 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 you know, the Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper, that is completely inaccurate. You know that, right? Mm-hmm. That, that the last uh, Passover, this Passover meal that Jesus would have had, and this particular supper too, they would recline to eat. They'd always recline on their left side and eat with their right hand. And they would have a horseshoe sized table. The Romans called that the triclinium. And this horseshoe table was a very low table. They would lie on these cushions, and the servants would come into the center of the horseshoe, and they'd serve from there. And so everybody's feet is sticking out. So it's very easy for Mary to anoint Jesus' feet. She didn't have to crawl under the table, and everybody's wondering, what the heck is she doing? You know? <laughs> his, feet would be sticking, his feet would be sticking out, and she anointed his feet, and then she did something no woman would ever do publicly. What did she do? She let down her hair. My grandmother, Josephine. My grandmother, Josephine, and my grandfather, Alfonso, they came over here from Italy, you know. They came through the island, right? And they were married for 73 years. You believe that? Married 73 years. But one thing that always amazed me, you know, uh, and I lived in a two-family home. My family lived down below. My grandparents lived upstairs. And I, you know, I mean, it was wonderful. There was no age uh, or generation gap. We all lived together. And everybody had to do what they had to do to be a part of the family. But my grandmother, every night before she would retire for the evening, she would let down her hair. I couldn't believe how long her hair was. All day long, and whenever she was in public, she always had it up in a bun. That, that was historical. Women did that for 
centuries, millennium. And their long hair was what? Their glory. Corinthians tells us that the long hair of a woman is her glory. But, but they would never, ever, ever let down their hair in public. That would be such a shameful thing to do. But they would let down their hair for their husbands to show their beauty and their glory. They would let down their hair as they would gather together with their husband intimately to pray. And Mary, Mary is surrendering her glory to the Lord and wiping his feet, anointing them with this oil, and I'm sure washing them with her tears. What an act of worship. How intimate, how personal, how tender. But no timidity to show it publicly. How many people are so timid and and almost embarrassed to display their love for Jesus publicly? Be, Be bold, my brothers and sisters, especially now. Be as bold as lions in this day of adversity in which we live. In the house, the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Well, I guess it was, you know, that, that 12 ounces of this perfume. No. Mary had a premonition. Mary was very insightful. Mary understood what was going to be taking place somehow, some way. She just, in her heart, knew. Because she, she was a very meditative person. Meditating on the words and the things that Jesus spoke. And Jesus was foretelling over and over and over his what? His death. And so she was doing that for his burial, honoring him. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, this is the first time uh, Simon speaks that we know of in in the gospel. What does he say? Why? Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? First time he speaks, what's he worried about? Money. Money. You know, in John 666, what does that say? Remember, we were there. John 666. And many walked with him no more. Judas didn't walk away. Judas saw Jesus as a means to an end. Not the end of all things. Mary, Mary saw Jesus as the answer to everything. He was her all in all. But as far as Judas was concerned, he's he's a a means to an end, a method. Hmm. You know why we're supporting Benny Matthews so generously this year? The man's a real deal. The man took in almost $2 million last year in his ministry. Why don't you guess how much went for salaries out of $2 million? Anybody? Anybody? Not much. How about three full-time employees, $110,000? Three full-time employees, a $2 million ministry, almost $2 million, $110,000 total. Do the math. Overwhelming majority that that man collects goes out into the field. VOM said he's the first missionary they've ever supported who refused to take the money. Ever. Goodwill, you know what the CEO of Goodwill makes? $8 $8 million. You know how much money Miracle Hill takes in a year? About $17 million last year. How much goes to salary administration? $10 million. Listen, you've got you to run the numbers because so many ministries, and I'm going to be exposing more because we don't want to be a part of that, but there are so many ministries where Jesus simply becomes a means to the ends. The ends is this, always this. John Michael, you got the chicken buckets ready? We... <laughs> We don't have any chicken buckets? What is that about? I'm sorry? Faith. This is a faith-based ministry. 30 years we've never taken an offering. 30 years. Never. Where God guides, God provides. God is my all in all. Jesus Christ, is he your all in all? Does he not know our every need, even before we ask, that he provides for us, not our wants, but our needs? Jesus says, never or ever will be, so help me God, being a means to an end. But for so many ministries, he is. And all you have to do is follow the numbers. It's gross. In John 6, 666, many walked with him no more. But Jesus said, no, 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 I think we can take advantage of this. There's an opportunity here. 
No, it wasn't that Jesus wasn't aware. He said to Simon Peter, haven't I chosen all of you and no, and one of you is the devil, the devil. These are the first words of Judas. Why would you do this? Was he concerned about the poor? No, not at all. Poor him, poor me. You know the last words Jesus, uh, Judas speaks? I have betrayed innocent blood and went on and hung himself. Don't ever, 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 ever fall prey to the devil's trap to make Jesus a means to an end. Ever. Jesus said, our all in all, he's our everything. The sufficiency of his word and the sufficiency of Jesus, the person, for all that we need in this life. This he said, verse 6, not that he cared for the poor but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus answered, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. How perceptive, how intuitive. Why was she so perceptive? Why was she so intuitive? Worship, she sat at his feet continually. Now listen, listen, you need to be perceptive. You need to be intuitive. You need to have an understanding of what in the world is going on. But the only way you're going to get that understanding clearly and be able to discern is you need to spend time with God in his word. He's going to guide you. Remember the testimony we had from the pastor's wife in Japan just before the tsunami hit that took out those reactors? And she's going to drive her little boy to school. And this was a a family, a a missionary family that were trying to share the gospel with the people there in that region of Japan. 1% of the Japanese people are Christian. 1%. That's it. And on the way to taking her child to school, and they would ride along the coast, that very coast that got wiped out by the tsunami, her little boy told her, Mommy, you got to turn around. Jesus told me, you need to go up the hill. The Holy Spirit of God confirmed that to her as well. She turned the car around. She went as high as she could go and it saved that family. How would they be so perceptive, so intuitive? How would they have such insight? Because God gives that. Listen, you you will never, ever, ever regret drawing as close as you possibly can to the Lord in knowing the Lord, because then the Lord will preserve you, and the Lord will speak to you directly. There'll be situations where he'll speak to you. It makes no sense to anybody else, but you know it's the Lord. How did Mary know? And his disciples in there. You know, I'm so thankful they record everything here. And John is so transparent. Because he's going to tell us in a minute, they didn't understand any of this. And so often when I I say, you know, I really don't understand this right now. I'm conflicted about this whole issue of abortion, what's happening in our nation. I don't, Lord, I I, I said to him yesterday, today, this morning, when I, I don't understand this, Lord. Show me. For the poor you will have you always, but me you do not have always. Again, for Mary, Jesus was her all in all. For Judas, a means to an end. Now, God wasn't, Jesus wasn't saying ignore the poor, but, but the poor will always be with you and you'll always have an opportunity to give to the poor, and we should, right? You know, there's a little ministry, but, you know, if, if, if all the churches in Greenville were as representative as we were yesterday, what would have happened? We would have shut that whole part of the city down. True? Yeah. No, this he said because he was worried about himself, taking care of himself. Verse 9, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, Jesus. And they came, but not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. I think Lazarus probably had to stay in seclusion most of the time now because he was probably the uh, biggest tourist attraction in Bethany, right? I mean, who would not want to talk to Lazarus? Would you not want to sit down and have a conversation with Lazarus today? I would. Tell me about those four days, right? Right? Do you like reading about life after death experiences that people have? Do you like listening to the testimonies on YouTube? 
Now, my wife doesn't enjoy that. I enjoy it. I enjoy it because I, I bounce their testimony upon, about what I know of the Word of God. And so if they line up, I say, oh, that's, 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 that was the Lord. They had a genuine experience. If it's not, then I, I cast it out. Because some of them you can tell pretty, pretty quickly it's, 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 a, it's fraudulent. It's a false testimony. But some of them are very, very revealing. Hmm? Wouldn't you like to know? Sure we would. There's so little that we know about heaven and what's going to take place after this. Truly, you know. But what I do know, I'm very, very excited about. And so they came because of Lazarus. They wanted to talk to Lazarus and ask him what he experienced. But verse 10, but the chief priest, now who was the chief priest? What, what political sect were they? The Sadducees. The Sadducees were in control. The Pharisees were like the back to the Bible people. They'd be like the, uh, the, the small community church pastors just teaching the Old Testament, teaching the Word of God, representing God to the people, representing the people to God. The Sadducees, they were like the First Baptist Church in Greenville. The First Baptist Church in Greenville is an abomination. They're so proud of the fact they're having the Greenville all-queer male choir sing this holiday season. And who leads that church? Two lesbians. It's not a church. No, 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 no. Now, that would be the Sadducees, okay? Because they, don't, they didn't believe there was any accountability to God after this life, so they grabbed for everything they could. They were the most perverted, twisted, evil. But the Pharisees, however, they were a different sort. Now, they, they, they really do believe that there was an accountability after death. Do you? You see, the reason why people can live the way they do like those ladies yesterday, I use the expression loosely, ladies, they just don't believe that there's going to be accountability one day. They're, they don't believe they're going to be held accountable for them. What they've done with Jesus. Oh, the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Listen, that whole dinner party was at risk. Not just being persecuted or mocked or spit on. But being imprisoned, being persecuted, being put to death. When was the last time you did something that would risk your life for Jesus? I haven't yet. Not that I'm aware of anyway. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. We'll, uh, we're going to end here at this point of the text, but what we really see is the madness or the insanity of unbelief. Now, how could these men rationally, rationally, come to the conclusion, okay, we don't believe in the resurrection. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. There's a multitude of witnesses who claim that this actually took place. Lazarus himself is bearing witness that it took place. Yet, we don't believe that. So, because of how we feel, and emotionally, I am charged over this, we're going to kill him. Does that make any sense at all? Uh, Caesar Nero, who was he? Hmm? He was the emperor, the Roman emperor. He was the Roman emperor. Now, somebody made a, uh, uh, an appeal to him and presented the gospel. Who was that? Paul. Paul the apostle, somewhere around 52, 53. Oh, excuse me, 59. Uh, 59. Paul went to Rome, made an appeal before Caesar. And he presented the gospel. What happened after Caesar Nero refused to receive the truth of the gospel? He became a madman. He went insane. The madness, the insanity of unbelief. Now, don't be surprised as you see our world becoming more and more mad, insane. Why? Because as God has revealed in his word, he gives them over to a reprobate mind. It doesn't mean that you just have an immoral mind. It means your mind is so twisted, your mind is so wicked, you can't think straight. And what did Caesar do after that witness that he rejected of Paul through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, 
of the person of Jesus Christ. What did he do then? He burned Rome. Burned for 10 days. Now he burnt Rome because he wanted to rebuild it, the city to his name. But who did he blame for all of that? He blamed the, the Christians. The Christians. And he, he was the one at Paul who did that. The, listen, the insanity of unbelief. Our world and our society has rejected him more and more and more. I, I, I've shown you Romans 1, where God gives them over to a sexual revolution, gives them over to a homosexual revolution, gives them over to a reprobate mind. And that's what's taking place now. You fellas, listen to me. You're not going to save the culture. From my understanding of the scriptures, my 40 years as a Christian, 30 years as a pastor, the culture is lost. It's gone. The culture is gone. We lost the culture war. The prince of the power of the air has taken over. There's no doubt about that. I would like to think differently. I would like to think there's going to be a, a revival in this country, a worldwide revival. My Bible doesn't tell me that. Now, you, men, listen to me, men, you, you need to do everything that you can under God's power, under the power of the Holy Spirit to save your family. Because that's what's at stake now. That's why I'm so thankful, Anthony and Veronica, do everything they can to make sure that our little ones know the gospel. That, that at, even at this youngest stage, they have an opportunity to open up their heart and their lives to Jesus. Because Jesus will protect them now and forever, if they give their heart to Jesus. We're secure, aren't we? He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, even unto the end of the age. When, you, when, when this life is over for you, however that may happen, guess what? Oh, you're coming home with me. Like Enoch. You know, Enoch walked with God. Hebrews tells us that, that he pleased God. Enoch pleased God. He walked with God. He followed God. He served God. He worshiped God. And he pleased God, and he was no more. They were walking one day, and, and Jesus said, you know, Enoch, we're closer to my house than we are to yours. Why don't you come home and have dinner with me? <laughs> and he never left. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful thought? One day, Jesus said, you're so close to my house now. Why don't you come home? Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Let it be. But right now, listen, you got to double down. Yeah, I, I shared my frustration this morning. But the word of God tells me that's exactly how it's going to be. Straight and difficult is the way. Narrow. But few will enter therein. Broad is the way. Wide is the gate. And many will enter therein. Is it true? Or is Jesus a liar? When you approach the time of the end, it'll be as in the days of Noah. What characterized the days of Noah? Read Dr. Henry Morris's record of, of the book of Genesis, and particularly the pre-Diluvian society that existed. Sodomy was commonplace. A, an obsession with the occult. Child sacrifice. All of the things, militant homosexuality, all of the things that we see experiencing in our society right now characterize the society in Noah's day. Isn't that amazing? as in the days of Noah. That'll be so vile <laughs> that that society towards the end of the age will cause Sodom and Gomorrah to blush. As Ruth Graham would say, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Ruth Graham said that. So my encouragement to you, Lazarus, Recognize, you were dead and now you're alive. My encouragement to you, Mary, worship the Lord. Make sure you're spending time sitting at his feet, receiving of the Lord. And he'll give you such intuitiveness, such a perceptivity, such, such an awareness of what's going on. No one will have to tell you. And then Martha, Martha, serve the Lord with gladness. Get involved. God will tell you what to do. Nobody's a spectator in his kingdom. And, 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 and then 
You'll be part of that family gathering at Bethany. Oh, Rit the leper will be there. (laughs) And I pray all of you, don't you want to be a part of that family? What a blessed, blessed dinner party that was. Amen? Yeah, shall we stand? David, you got a closing song?